This is CBC Vancouver News. The deadline to temporarily move has come and gone. Get in bed! Get inside the bed! And, and now we're just dealing with a few who um, need a little bit more help uh, to move along. I just want everybody to remember this is uh, everybody's human down here. The Crab Park cleanup started today, but not without some heated moments between city crews and those living there. Plus, commuters brace for a big closure. The Expo line will terminate at Surrey Central Station during this work. TransLink is getting ready to shut down the King George SkyTrain station for six weeks for maintenance work. Also, cruise ships will soon be back in Nanaimo. I think it's fantastic. It's a great opportunity for our economy to introduce more tourists to the area. After a years-long hiatus, locals are hopeful the industry's return will trigger a swell in tourism spending. Hi, I'm Tanya Fletcher. Thanks for joining us. The deadline for people living in Vancouver's Crab Park to temporarily relocate has come and gone. Police and park rangers descended on the encampment this morning, marking the beginning of what's being called a cleanup of the area. But as John Hernandez reports, many residents weren't ready to leave today and tensions boiled over. Get inside the bed! Get inside the bed! The tent city residents found themselves cut off from their shelters Monday morning. The encampment surrounded by a fence put up by city staff and guarded by police and park rangers. I just want everybody to remember this is uh, everybody's human down here. Last week, residents were given notice to relocate their belongings to a temporary camping area nearby so city crews could clean up the encampment. Park officials said they consulted with residents, citing concerns over syringes, feces and rats. Yeah, I think through those conversations we've devised a plan um, that, that worked for most and, and now we're just dealing with a few who um, need a little bit more help uh, to move along. The vast majority of shelters were still standing by the imposed deadline. Confusion and anxiety as some residents tried to get back in to retrieve belongings but were kept out. It's a, just a really deplorable, egregious waste of money and resources. It's really inhumane. The encampment has been in place for years after a B.C. court ruled residents couldn't be evicted because of a lack of shelters in the city. Residents have since built a warming hut, even a kitchen, but fear they'll both be destroyed during the cleanup. I think that they're hoping for everybody to um, disband and just like go off on their own separate ways. The park board says the structures are too dangerous to remove by hand. So there will be some heavy equipment on site uh, to do the cleanup. Um, and then we'll level the land and I believe the intention is to layer some gravel and, and rocks. So. For people having, who've lived here for years or months having to witness this today is really traumatizing. Calls for an alternative community-led cleanup have fallen on deaf ears. The city says the structure removal will take at least one week before allowing residents back in. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, preparations are being made to close King George SkyTrain station for six weeks for repair work. Starting late next month, the Expo line will temporarily end at Surrey Central Station. Both of those stations see upwards of 11,000 commuters every day. TransLink says plans are in the works to mitigate disruptions. We'll have extra bus service every 15 minutes between 6 and 9 a.m. on weekdays. So that will help alleviate a lot of the crowding where people that normally take the SkyTrain from King George, because the station being closed, they'll have that extra bus service in the morning. TransLink says it's ramping up service during the morning rush hour since the busy periods for the commute home are more spread out. The station is being closed so that crews can remove a piece of rail line and replace a mechanical device that guides the trains from one track to another. This section of track has been in use since the station first opened three decades ago. TransLink is also planning to do a number of other upgrades at the same time. Well, the province is handing out another $24 million to communities that want to improve their walking and cycling infrastructure by building multi-use pathways, protected bike lanes and pedestrian bridges. With this BC Active Transportation funding, we are reshaping the future of transportation and critical connections on active school routes here in Souk. 
This funding and these improvements will not only enhance connectivity, but also promote safety and accessibility for our community. So far, the province has fronted nearly 300 projects through this funding over the last five years. With 13 FIFA World Cup matches slated for Canada in 2026, the Federal Competition Bureau has unveiled a digital tip line to report suspected collusion. It's meant to help detect and deter illegal agreements. We ensure that um, you know, like the, these types of um, of events are are actually held, uh, uh, you know, at the best value for money possible and that uh, consumer have confidence in the marketplace uh, when, uh, when, these t we, when these types of, uh, of events are actually, are actually happening. The tip line is part of a joint initiative by the Competition Bureau, the U.S. Justice Department, and Mexico's Federal Economic Competition Commission. Health trends on social media are always changing to find a niche audience, and one of those areas is men's health and fitness. Much of that content focuses on gym tips and dieting, with creators like the Liver King on TikTok telling men to eat large amounts of raw organ meats to help gain muscle, and others like Joey Swole giving tips on how to improve exercise form. Well, Paul Sharp is a UBC Research Fellow with the Men's Health Research Program. He joins us now from Sydney, Australia, where he does some of his work, uh, to chat about these trends. Paul, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. So we'll get right to it. Are there risks to following health advice like excessive bodybuilding and extreme supplement intake? And, and can those also be beneficial? Yeah, sure. Well, I guess the first thing that I'll say about that is that I'm a huge proponent for regular exercise and maintaining a healthy, balanced diet, um, not only for the health benefits of it, but for men, there can be improvements in self-confidence. It can be a way to reduce stress, um, and it can also be a social activity to get together with other guys. The issue comes around social media, and what we see from the research is that a lot of the health information shared online is either misleading or not founded in evidence. Um, and we need to keep coming back to the idea that these social media influencers are often being sensational and over-the-top personas because they're trying to sell a brand. Um, you know, if we look at the example of the Liver King, he started on social media to um, sell his supplement brand. So we see this increase that men are now turning to these muscle building supplements, things like whey protein, creatine, pre-workouts, um, to help them achieve their fitness goals. And in Canada, these are classified as natural health products, which is largely an under-regulated industry. Um, and for most people, they end up self-prescribing and self-dosing their own supplements. So this can have an individual response. There can also be interactions between the supplements that we're taking um, or other medications that an individual might be taking as well. Mm. So while we often associate this muscularity with health, there is the potential for adverse health effects. It can have a strain on our internal systems and organs. And we see this with some high profile cases of um, seemingly healthy bodybuilders that are passing away too young. Men's health trends are sometimes branded as, as a lifestyle that goes beyond a person's health. How are these trends changing the way we define masculinity? Yeah, it's so interesting because these influences are all around us. They're social influences that tell us what our body should look like. Um, they tell us essentially what it means to be a man. And in the past 20 years, the dominant body ideal for men has shifted towards increased muscularity. It has an emphasis on kind of um, lean bodies, fat-free mass, um, and we're seeing a corresponding rise in muscle, dysmor uh, muscle dysmorphia sorry, among men. Um, so social media can really perpetuate these unrealistic and ultimately unattainable ideals um, that is leading to disordered eating, excessive exercising, and anabolic steroid use. The Liver King himself, despite having this kind of back to the basics, all natural brand, has actually admitted to taking performance enhancing drugs to achieve his physique. There's a lot to this, you're right, from the marketing to the psychology behind it, but we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your expertise today. Thank you very much. Well, the Port of Nanaimo is preparing to welcome cruise ships once again for the first time since 2019. As Claire Palmer reports, there are high hopes it'll trigger a growth spurt in the local tourism industry. 
It's all hands on deck in Nanaimo as the port makes preparations to welcome the Seaborn Odyssey and MS Regatta to the docks. We've got the space, we've got the availability. We, Our residents are keen to see the ships here and welcome the, the tourists. A cruise terminal and dock was set up back in 2011 to drive economic development in Nanaimo, planned for use by cruise ships like this one back in 2019. The goal was to see 25 to 30 ships a year, but Nanaimo hasn't seen any cruises since the pandemic canceled all six planned stops in 2020. The return has excited locals as Nanaimo continues to develop its tourism industry. The optimism was very high. Uh, two cruise ships in a year is very good, but uh, much like Oliver Twist, I think it's fair to say we want some more. The focus will be on bringing smaller ships to town and offering a unique and intimate experience. Cruise guests will be able to explore Nanaimo's waterfront, museums and breweries. Thomas says that there will also be excursion packages for local wineries and trips to areas like Cathedral Grove. Well, it's a huge impact for the local economy from a tourism perspective. I mean passengers get off cruise ships and they've got money burning a hole in their pocket and they want to spend it at our local businesses. Local businesses are excited at the prospect. The tourists really enjoy our waterfront and so having the cruise ships be a part of that just makes it that much richer for all of us. Residents in Nanaimo say bring it on. We introduce more tourists to the area because uh, we need more people downtown spending money. It's a beautiful spot. Welcome to Nanaimo. <laughs> gives the smaller center some, you know, more interest. But my other thought is the traffic. I, I mean, it's all great if people come off the ships and stay local. The port already has four ships booked for the 2025 season and two more for 2026. Claire Palmer, CBC News, Nanaimo. Well, spring break is here, and for some, that means it's time to kick back and relax with a good book. Our Michelle Gomez took to the streets to hear recommendations from various Vancouverites. In the midst of spring break, we're asking Vancouverites what they're reading. Here's what they had to say. Gary Snyder, some poetry of Gary Snyder. Some uh, Robert Heinlein, just some science fiction here. And then some more Arthur C. Clarke science fiction. That's about it. It's a very solitary thing. I like being solitary and I also like being in other people's worlds and seeing how other people think. Like especially say like H.G. Wells, right? H.G. Wells, 1890, whatever he wrote. He basically predicted a lot of things like cell phones and all this stuff, right? How does he know that stuff, right? Yeah. So the themes and things like that and like a lot of people have, you know, like especially science fiction, it's like it's all coming to pass now, right? Bye, who's that by? Uh, I think it's Michael Asinger. Okay, and what do you like about it? It's a shift in your mindset and your perspective. You gotta read it. So it's a magazine from the, uh, an ivory. You see, they are very informative. I'm honestly not much of a reader, to be honest. <laughs> but when I was a kid, uh, my favorite book was The Diary of a Wimpy Kid. And like, I re there was like six of them and I read all of them. I love that one, yeah but I don't always read the books. <laughs> it's hard to keep up with it. The last one was Dewar, um, Cloud, something or other. And that was very fascinating. Louise Penny, I just love. Do you love reading? Oh yeah, usually you read nonfiction. I'm reading 12 Trees by Dan Lewis. It's incredible about how to save the earth through these trees. Um, but these are my distraction novels. Honestly, I am reading my Bible and it's the best book ever. <laughs> There's no other reason to read anything else. Psychology of Money, small book. So I started reading it a month ago. Uh, after three chapters, I left the book in my airplane when I was flying in the airplane. So I got another copy because I really like it. I don't know the name in English. Oh, you have it in your bag. Yeah. Mira Kundera. Tracy West, Dragon Masters. Perfect for six to Eight. And my granddaughter is an avid reader at eight, and uh, yeah, she she loves books. Still ahead, Alberta launches an investigation after CBC News revealed vulnerable patients were being sent to hotels. That's coming up next.
And thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. Well, the Junos took place last night in Halifax. Snotty Nose Res Kids, a band from BC's Hydla First Nation, were nominated for two Junos. Our Dan Burrett spoke with one of the band members about the Indigenous representation at the awards show last night. You, you didn't win, hate to say, but you have won many Junos in the past. Uh, what stood out for you from last night? Um, it was just uh, the biggest thing for me was seeing the representation on behalf of the Indigenous community. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like our first Junos in 2019, it was just us in the Indigenous category, which was like, I don't know, four or five, mm -hmm. four or five of us, six maybe. And like you fast forward to this year and there was 38 of us nominated outside of the category you know what i mean so you love to see, you love to see the growth obviously it wasn't going to happen overnight but it's gradually happening and you just love to see it mm -hmm. and there were some fabulous uh performances last night what was it oh for sure uh, what was it like to be in that room for that tribute to robbie robertson with ace and abby allison russell i mean william prince many guests mm -hmm. it was beautiful man uh I tend to stay off my phone in moments like that because I just want to just embrace it in full as it is. And it was beautiful, man. And it just goes to show like the doors that he knocked down for artists like them and us to be able to do what we do. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So it was beautiful. What does it say that you've gone from what you said years ago around six nominations now to 38 but that moment where uh, it was acknowledged that Robbie had to hide his indigeneity for so long mm -hmm. so many decades ago and when he when mm -hmm. he chose to reveal it that those were on his terms but what a progression that has been albeit a long time yeah I mean it goes to show like how the times are changing whereas mm -hmm. like you look at you look at us, like me and my brother, we came out the gate be like, nah, this is who we are. Yep. We ain't hiding. We're, we're not hiding anything. This is who we are. You get us in full. So it just goes to show like how much has changed over the years. And, you know, big ups to him, man. I'm glad he yep. finally got the, the love and respect that he rightfully deserved. Welcome back. The Alberta government is launching several investigations after CBC News revealed some vulnerable patients were being discharged to hotels instead of properly staffed care facilities. Julia Wong has the latest. More than two dozen people, many vulnerable, some discharged from hospital, were sent to this hotel, including Chris Semkin's nephew, who is autistic and has high needs. Initially shocked on the news reports, I was very concerned. Thanks for coming. Now, the province says the vast majority of the group has been moved to an apartment building and is getting proper support. Over the past 72 hours, Alberta Health and AHS arranged for a mobile health unit, which included a nurse practitioner and paramedic, to offer on-site assessments to all clients. The Alberta government is launching four investigations into the agency that put people into the hotel, Contentment Social Services. The government will look at possible elder abuse and neglect and possible misuse of government income supports and more. And says the government... That I've instructed Alberta Health Services and any of my department not to interact with this particular agency. Alberta's action comes after CBC News first broke the story more than a week ago of Blair Caniff, who had been in hospital waiting for a care home and wound up at a travel lodge instead. 
The Alberta government is now looking at regulating agencies like contentment. Why didn't the government have oversight on this to start with? So when they're saying, hey, come live with us here or come live with our organization and we will provide services beyond housing, that is relatively new uh, for what has taken place in the province and that's why we're going to uh, look at regulating that gap. This health law expert says the province is fixing a problem it created. In this case really illustrates the challenges with discharging patients and the fact that that's something that government really ought to have been vigilant about. Chris Semkin says more oversight is clearly necessary. Hopefully they take care of it now and actually see to it that these people are taken care of properly. A 95-year-old veteran from Saskatchewan hit the slopes for the first time in eight decades. Harley Welsh is blind, but with a little help, he was able to sit ski, and CBC was there to capture him in action. <laughs> You're doing great! I was trying to concentrate on the yodeling, so I wasn't scared. <laughs> <laughs> what did it feel like? A little bumpy, but... Uh... Yeah, it was great. We have Harley and Mary, and both are residents at Sherbrooke Community Centre. Uh, Mary is 93 and is trumped by two years by Harley, who is 95. Um, and they are here today uh, skiing, and this is their first time in the in the sit ski. <laughs> Harley, <laughs> <like yours. laughs> perfect. <laughs> Harley taught me how to yodel. I taught Harley how to sit ski, and it was a beautiful day. This blue skies, perfect conditions, and it was a great time. It provides so much well-being for them. It, this is, this is fun. This is, you know, there's joy and anticipation. There's, it's a lot of work to to lead up to this, and so there's excitement about that. And then, you know, as as you're seeing today, they're scooting down the hill, and it's it's so much fun. Like you said, you only live once. Yep. <laughs> to uh, yep. see their smiles and to hear everyone uh, cheer. Uh, one of the questions we always ask new skiers is, did you ever picture yourself doing this? And uh, they embrace it. It really does take a village to make this happen. And uh, I don't know if we're going to get them off the hill because <laughs> they just keep coming down the hill. Uh, so this is just a really wonderful day. Well, I was trying to yodel, but <laughs> it got a little squeaky sometimes. Some, sometimes it was closer. <laughs> and here's a live shot of the Georgia Viaduct. The rain will linger until midweek. We'll time out the return of the sunny weather with the full forecast next. Iftar, it's, a, it's where we break our fast for all the Muslims here. So any Muslim here on the island that's doing their fast and all that, they're welcome to join us. Ramadan might seem for a lot of people that might not be and like common, like it's not something that you, they're used to. Their first thought is, oh, they are a bunch of people that are not eating or drinking anything from sunrise to sunset. There's a lot of meanings behind Ramadan that uh, a lot of people won't understand until they experience it themselves. Ramadan proves for all of us that we can go through something as difficult as uh, fasting, a dry fast for a long period of time. And it gives us a lot of other benefits and experiences that we might not otherwise get without Ramadan. So here at the mosque, uh, the management organizes uh, uh, the food for the people who are studying or who are bu busy with, uh, with their lives. For me, my family is in India. So that's why I don't have anybody at home. So I feel like when I come here, it feels like we are a family together and it feels really good. Uh, we have a big international community here in PI. We have a lot of people that uh, don't necessarily are, uh, are not here necessarily with their family. So it's, it's uh, kind of a requirement for us to make them feel like they are a part of the family. So we try and do our best there. I've been here without my family for five years now. And uh, I come from a culture where the f especially the first day of Ramadan, it's a big celebration. It's the whole family gets together, everyone kind of sits around the table and enjoys the time and we spend the whole day with each other. 
up to sunrise where we uh, then prepare for to fast again. Uh, so coming here to the island, you kind of lose a bit of that, but eventually you kind of find the community to fit in to kind of replace it. Uh, obviously it's not going to replace 100%, but it does the job. Especially when I moved here at first time, uh, I didn't know anybody here. And when I, mo uh, when I came to the mosque and saw people here, I made connection. It helped me academically, professionally, and uh, it really helps to uh, understand the, the beautiful uh, island and, the, and its people and the culture. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. On April 13th, join CBC at the Vancouver Vasaki Festival. Drop by the CBC Vancouver tent, say hi, and win some fun CBC prizes. The Vasaki Festival continues in Surrey on April 20th. The event features some of the biggest celebrations outside India with colorful floats, community performers, and live music all rich in culture. More info at cbc.ca slash bc. The weather update is brought to you by Direct by Furnace. To cool and clean the air in your home, call Direct by Furnace. Installing Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. Let's bring in our Darius Madavi for a look at the forecast. And Darius, yesterday was so beautiful, but today we really reverted back to that winter-like <laughs> weather. Yeah, I mean, some people saw the sun at some point. I know the kids did some places in the valley. Uh, maybe we did downtown and I was just locked in the radio booth and didn't notice. But regardless, the sun will come back tomorrow afternoon. We should see some uh, sunshine here in Metro, uh, across Metro Vancouver, really, uh, and across the south coast, Vancouver Island, really the entire southern parts of BC. Uh, and then the real sun doesn't return until Friday, Saturday, Sunday, but it will be a beautiful Easter weekend. Uh, now, we did see some precipitation across the province earlier today, but I really wanted to point out though was that the freezing levels are starting to come down we're starting to see snow in more places rather than rain so those freezing levels are going to stay low drop again wednesday uh, meaning some more snow before we're starting to rise again as we head into the weekend so a little bit of good news there for the mountains uh, and anybody who's hoping to go skiing on this uh, bluebird weekend coming up uh, now if we take a look at where the precipitation is going we're going to see some more scattered showers tonight tomorrow mostly clearing up we start to see this cloud start to clear out across the southern parts of bc you will still have cloud at some points but you should get some sun as well uh, if we see the next front coming in is going to be uh, hitting the island sort of early morning Wednesday and then making its way to Metro Vancouver and the rest of the south coast and then we're going to see that system sort of roll out Thursday still some unsettled conditions some scattered showers but the real rain comes in a block of just a few hours on Wednesday for us here in Metro Vancouver probably the worst of it uh, sort of 5 a.m. to around early afternoon so should start to dry up again as we get later in the day uh, with that front though also coming some strong winds particularly for the west coast of the island and the north island maybe a second burst of some gusty winds on thursday but we will see the worst of it on wednesday uh, and then if we take a look at our temperatures coming up a couple degrees tomorrow in the south falling a few degrees on wednesday and then coming back up again on thursday so not too much to talk about in terms of temperatures just fluctuation of four or five degrees across the south if we look at our conditions again this is looks like a lot of activity but it is just scattered showers don't expect more than maybe an hour of some light rain maybe a little bit heavier in some places but for the most part, very calm day tomorrow with again a little bit of sunshine. Then we get some rainy periods on Wednesday, some overcast showery conditions on Thursday, and then we start to see some of that cloud lighten up for a bluer day Friday and Saturday. Should see very little sun, uh, very little cloud actually, just a lot of sunshine. Slowly but surely marching our way back to sun. Thanks so much, Darius. Thank you.
And that is your late news for this Monday, March 25th. For news anytime, anywhere, download the free CBC News app. You can always find us online as well. We're at cbc.ca slash bc. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great night.